If you understand about the churches, Jesus himself has dictated to John just exactly what he wanted to say to those churches. And the churches received uh, the letter or, or the epistle that, that, that is given, and, and it included uh, all the churches being able to read what was going on in, in the other churches that, that, that are there. When you get to the church at Pergamos, <clears throat> you find out that the pastor has already read about what has taken place at Ephesus where there is a passionless church, a church that has left its first love. He has heard about the church at Smyrna, which is just down the road, just a little bit from where he is. And, and he has heard about the fact that the church is going to go through persecutions. And, and then he probably very cautiously opens the scroll that has to deal with the church that, that he is pastoring because he is probably intimidated over, over what is going to happen or what is going to be said. And it's recorded for us in the Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. And, and you can follow along with me in your Bible or, or you can look on the screen. This is coming from the New King James Version. And it says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes. I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. And, and this is the word of God. The first thing that you will notice when you uh, start reading is you will notice something about the church that is in Pergamos. The first thing that you probably wonder about is, is where in the world is, is Pergamos? Pergamos is a city that is located about 40 to 45 miles north of Smyrna or about 80 miles from Ephesus. You remember we're going north up close to the Aegean Sea. The city stood on the banks of a river, Caicos, and, and it, it is about 20 miles from, from the sea itself, if you can remember uh, your, your geography. It is still in existence. We talk about our history of 247 years, some odd. They're talking about thousands of years of history. It's called uh, Bergama today. It's in Turkey. And it has a population of about 20,000 people, and about 10% of those people profess to be Christians. It could boast of one of the great libraries of, of, of antiquity, and it was the first place where, where parchment was used. Parchment is a thin, flat material that, that's been prepared from the skin of an animal. You realize up until this time they've, they've used papyrus, which was, was made out of reeds or, 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 or sticks or stems. Uh, we understand that it's used as a durable riding surface uh, that is going to be used from, from now on. It could be rolled up 
and it could be put in a scroll. And, 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 and a lot of times those scrolls, once they were rolled up uh, like, a, like a piece of paper, is, is rolled up like this. Then they would take right here on the opening flap and, and they would melt some wax on it and, and they would take their signet ring and, and they would put an impression upon it in, in order to know that this is a, this is a document. And, and this is what is going on when we find out that the Bible talks about books. Uh, they didn't have books back then. They, they had this pampers. They, they really had scrolls. And, and so it, it was parchment. And this, this name parchment uh, it is a word out of the Greek language, pergamene. Uh, it, it comes from the word uh, pergamos, this city that, and this church that we're talking about, because this is where that was originated from. This is where they developed that, that parchment. And the city had once been the capital of the Roman province of Asia until Smyrna took over, o, over that place. So uh, Pergamon was one of the most important cities that are located there in Asia Minor. Uh, archaeologists have, have dug around and they've dated it back to the Bronze Age, Bronze Age if there was ever such a thing. And, and the peak uh, of the glory uh, of that city came during what is known as a Hellenistic period when it became an independent kingdom under the Attalid dynasty. Hellenist is a word that we use in, in church. It's used in the Bible. That relates to, to Greece, uh, about their history, their, their language, and their culture from the death of Alexander the Great to the defeat of Cleopatra and Mark Antony by Octavian in 31 B.C. So we, we understand that, that during this period that Greek culture flourished, spreading through the Mediterranean and to the uh, Near East, even in, over into Asia and centering in Alexandria, in Egypt, and Pergamon, in, in Turkey. We cannot get away from the fact that that there are kingdoms that, that have marked our periods of history. And one of the greatest of those is the Greek Empire. The Greek Empire left us so much, and, and they had such an influence in culture that, that the Bible that, that the Old Testament people had and the Old Testament language that they used, either Hebrew or Aramaic, was put aside, uh, and, and the Greek language was, was accepted instead. And so during the intertestamental period, uh, there were 70 scholars that got together and translated the Old Testament Hebrew and Aramaic language into the Greek language because that's what everybody was speaking that's what everybody was doing. And, and as a result, uh, some of the, the, the Hebrew people uh, forgot how to read their own language because Greek had, had become uh, so prominent. The New Testament is given to us in what we call Koine Greek. Koine just means common Greek. It's marketplace. It's people that talk like you and me, you know. They use uh, slang and they use southern language and, and instead of using uh, the, the highbrow Greek language. It's just how you would meet people as you've met them on the street. Pergamum was a place where great wealth was accumulated and the building uh, of, of world renown were constructed dur during this period. They, they had a, a library. We, we don't think much about libraries anymore. I don't think about libraries. I used them when I was going to school. I'd go to Samford to go to Southeastern. Uh, I would go to some of the local libraries to do research and things of that nature. And, 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 and I've got a computer now, and I don't have to do that anymore. I have access to just about everything that is in the world. It's on the internet, whether good or bad. It's there, and it is a great, great help to us. And the, the, the signs of its splendor included a, a, a theater. It was a, a Asclepium, 
uh, it's hard to say that word. It was a, it was a healing center. Uh, Asclepia uh, were healing temples in, in ancient Greeks. And uh, they were dedicated to uh, Asclepius, the first doctor demagogue in, in Greek mythology. Greek mythology had a god for, for everything that you can imagine, the sun, the moon, the stars, even health and healing. Uh, and, and it was said that this, this, this Greek mythological god uh, was so skilled that he could raise the dead. So, so stemming from these great healing powers, pilgrims would, would, would flock to, to the temples that were built in his honor in order to seek spiritual and physical healing. We have just up the road... Uh, one of these cities, and, and the name escapes me now, and, and, and it used to flourish because uh, Blunt Springs was, was a place where, where people from all over the world would come because it had these springs, and everybody said, hey, if you drink the water or come sit in it, uh, you know, it's going to make you better. And, and we have these all throughout the United States that people will go, and, and, and they will take part in those. It also had a gymnasium, and, and, and they did the games and stuff. And they had several famous temples, including uh, those of Augustus Caesar. Augustus started this, this Roman Empire kind of thing. And Athenia and, and Polius and, and, and the temple of Zeus uh, was, was there as well. Zeus is the equivalent uh, uh, of Jupiter in the, in, in the Roman thought and, and, and culture. So you, you see that, that Pergamum was one of the most beautiful places there in Asia Minor. But then you, you contrast what's going on in the city uh, to, to the fact of, of what's happening uh, with Pergamus, the church. When you read in the Bible concerning Pergamus, you have no earthly idea who is the founding person of the church there in Pergamos. Nothing in the Bible is said anything about who founded the church. No notable persons. Uh, nothing is said about the church family itself. Uh, there is a mention of, of Antipas, uh, who the Bible says in the text that I read for you is a faithful martyr. Uh, that, that's all, all that we know or know about the congregation. Uh, we, in the New Testament, find that there are a lot of times that the writer, when he gets to the end of his letter that he's writing to these churches or to these people, says, those that are with me greet you, and then there is a list of names, and greet those that are in the church over there where you are. And, uh, but there's nothing like that concerning the church. It has an absolutely no history for us whatsoever. But it does start out with the fact that we, we see that, that Christ is identified. And he is identified by the writing it says. And these things says to he who has a sharp two-edged sword. When we think about swords and sharp swords and two-edged swords, they're associated with Jesus in, in the Revelation. Five times they're, they're mentioned in the Revelation. Two-edged sword, this statement is used twice concerning Jesus in, in the opening statement in verse number 16 of chapter 1. And then in verse 16 of chapter 2, it talks about Jesus having a, a, a two-edged sword. And in Roman thinking, the sword was the, the symbol of, of the highest order of official authority that was invested in the proconsul of, of Asia. The right of the sword has the same meaning as the power of life or, or, or death. When you see that, that there is this... this uh, God of justice that they have. You know this, this blind lady that's holding a, a pair of balance scales in her hands and said, well, you know, when you get to the judgment, you're going to be weighed in the balances. Uh, she also has a sword in her left hand, if you'll look at that statue very closely. 
Because along with this comes, comes judgment that she not only has the power to judge, but she has the power of, of life and, and death as well. In Christian thinking, we think in Christian thinking that, that the two-edged sword is, is the word of God. When we read Proverbs chapter 18, verse number 21, the Bible says that, that death and life are in the power of the tongue. We find out that, that this is two-edged sword of the Lord Jesus is coming out of his mouth. The book of Hebrews gives us an insight when it talks about the word of God. It says that the word of God is living, it is powerful, and it is sharper than any two-edged sword sword piercing even to the divisions of the spirit and the soul and the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart this is what the bible does it it is a a sword that can pierce to the division of souls and spirit and joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart in john's description of the Lord Jesus Christ, when he comes, describes Jesus in Revelation chapter 19, verse number 13 through verse number 15. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in white linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses, Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule with a rod of iron. And he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of the almighty God. He said that Jesus is going to ride again on his little white horse. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword which with it he should strike the nations. And then John continues on in verse number 21 of the same chapter, Revelation 19. And the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. So whether we're thinking of the sword as a Greek sword or a Roman sword or as a Christian sword, the two-edged sword is the highest order of official authority. When Jesus speaks and the word of God comes out of his mouth like a two-edged sword that's able to divide in the souls and spirit, he says that when I speak, whatever I say is going to come to pass. When we studied in Genesis chapter 1, we noticed that there were 10 commands of creation. And each time Jesus said, let there be The next statement was, it was so. We find out that when Jesus speaks, when this Bible speaks, and it doesn't have to be changed for each culture and each generation, it's the same yesterday, today, and forever like the Lord Jesus Christ is. We understand that Jesus defines himself, describes himself as one who has this sharp two-edged sword. We recognize that as we think about the Lord in his opening statements. But we also think about the fact that Jesus has a a, a commendation to the church that is there. He has some good things that, that he wants to say. He begins by saying, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. We understand that that Jesus knows everything that goes on in the church. He knows everything that goes on in the world. And there's nothing hid from the knowledge of Christ. He is all-knowing and he has some good things to speak concerning the church. The first thing that he says is that there is a a loyalty to Christ. I know your works and where you dwell and where Satan's throne is. He has a knowledge. He talked about their vigilance. He said, you are a working church. They're industrious. They're conscientious. They're not lazy. 
They're not slothful. Realize that nothing is accomplished apart from hard work. We understand that it's called hard work doing church business because sometimes doing church business is a hard thing to have done. We understand just the, the setting up of the structure of our auditorium this morning. That's hard work. It's going to stay here till Thursday. And then all of this is going to disappear and they're going to make preparations for Sunday morning worship. Next week when we meet here again, the church will be set up like this so that it will accommodate us for the next 10 or 12 weeks because they're doing a, 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 a better man thing on, on, on Tuesday morning and then they're doing the Wednesday night ladies class in, in here and, and this, this, is, this is a better arrangement so that you can have a table where you can put your Bibles on and you can have your paper and you can have your pencil and you can take notes and, 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 and be able to access better the things that are being spoken so we understand that, that they were a hard-working church. And, and Jesus said, I not only know what you're doing, I know where you dwell. You dwell where Satan's throne is. When he talked about Satan's throne, he's talking about the seed of power. It is a reference to Pergamum's worship either of the Roman emperor himself or of the fact that he's going to worship Zeus at his altar on the local Acropolis, or, or both of them. Zeus is a, is a mythological god, God, and, and, and he is the god of the sky, and, and he is the thunder god uh, in ancient Greek religions who rules as the kings of all the gods on Mount Olympus. And so his name is similar to, to the Roman equivalent of, uh, of Jupiter. And, and they have these big temples where people would come and they're going to worship this mythological God. And, and it has become a place where the Bible says where Satan's throne is. We deal a lot with Satan in the book of the Revelation, and you're going to find out that, that Satan is actually going to embody an individual that we're going to call the Antichrist, and he is going to do his work as Jesus, who was the embodiment of God, came to do his work. And we'll contrast those both later on. But Jesus says, I, I know your diligence, I know where you dwell, and I know what you're doing. And it was a commendation that says, you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith. There is 10 commandments that are given. And I've made the 11th one. In the King James Version, it's hangeth in there. Because serving God is, is sometimes tough. And he said that in the midst of the toughness of, uh, of the times at Pergamos, Jesus said, you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even to the point to where Antipas was a, a, a faithful martyr. Christianity in those days, and even in our days, is, is tough. And when the going got tough, the tough got going. And, and so... It takes more than, than just this one-liner when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Uh, it takes more than that to get the job done. When, when it, things are hard in the church, that's when the power of God comes and we hold fast to those principles on which our church is founded. Reinhold Niebuhr, who was a pastor during World War II in, in Germany, was, was put to death by, by the Nazis because of his faith in Christ. And because of his faith in Christ, he stood against the workings of Hitler. And Hitler had him put into jail and ultimately killed him. One of his friends, while he was in prison, visited him and asked, what are you doing in there? 
And the response of Reinhold Niebuhr was, what are you doing out there? Because things were tough during World War II in Germany for people who were Christians. Folks say, well, well, you know, Hitler was a Christian. No, he wasn't. He, he was a sorry uh, fellow that, that, that did everything that he could to abolish those who did not think like he thought. So the church had something to do, and they were doing it. They were, they, there was a loyalty to, to Christ's commands. They, they were uh, holding on to, to the Lord Jesus, and, and there was a willingness to be marked for Christ. They did not deny the faith that they had in the Lord Jesus Christ. There was a willingness to be martyred for Christ. And martyrdom, or the word martyr, comes out of the Greek language, which is translated to witness. He was a faithful witness. He was, he was a martyr. And down through church history, book after book after book have been written about people uh, who were uh, martyred for the Lord Jesus Christ. We have in the 20th century, they say that more people were martyred for Christ during the 20th century than in those other 19 centuries put together. It's, it's still being a time of persecution uh, and martyrdom from the, for, for the church. They were loyal to the Lord Jesus and to his commands. And then there was a condemnation of Christ in verses 14 and 15. You understand that there isn't a perfect church. We're going to talk about one that appears to be perfect. But there isn't any perfect church. So if you find one, don't join it. Uh, you will ruin it. Uh, because because we're, we're imperfect. Uh, there are problems. And there are problems within the church. The fallacy of modern preachers is that they're afraid of the negative things that happen even within the, the church. They don't preach about sin. They don't preach about salvation. They don't preach about the cross. They don't preach about righteousness. They don't preach about the judgment to come. So how can they know just exactly the true state that they are in if you can ever get a man lost, then you can get him saved. But he's not going to get saved unless he realizes that one day that God is going to judge him according to sin and righteousness, and then there is a judgment which is to come. Paul would write, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We tell them, listen, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and he loves you, and he wants you to be saved. But if you reject that, you're confronted with your own sins and the judgment of the Lord Jesus Christ that is to come. He writes in there, he says that there are a few things that I have against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balaam to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, those things which I hate. When we look, the Bible tells us about the doctrine of Balaam in verse number 14. We read about him in the book of Numbers. And we do that as, as we, we through, read through our Bibles. Balaam is a Gentile mercenary prophet. To put it bluntly in Walker County language, he is, he's a paid preacher. And, and that's all he is. He has a remarkable grasp of the truth a thorough knowledge of the very character of God, a deep insight to the future of God's people and a desire to die the death of the righteous. The only problem with Balaam was that though he desired to die the death of the righteous, his problem was that he did not want to live the life of the righteous. 
What he said, what he believed was different from the, the way that he lived. He had two fatal flaws. Lust, wealth, and women. That's three, I said two. P.T. Barnum said that every man has a price, and it was certainly true about Balaam. Balaam prophesied to King Balak about the children of Israel in, in, in a purpose that, that he might be, might be paid. Three things that we noticed about, about Balaam. First of all, we noticed the wisdom of this world. Balaam, when he was hired by King Balak to curse the children of Israel, he said, if I can't curse them, which he could not, he said, I can corrupt them. This is one of Satan's ploys that, that he has in the fact that he cannot curse the Christian church, nor Christianity, nor its people, its followers, but he can corrupt them. And he sets out to do this. And Balaam's idea that he impressed upon the mind of King Balak was, if you corrupt them, then God will chasten them. And if he chastens them, their numbers will diminish and there will not be nearly as many to fight against. Their God is holy and he is jealous and will not stand by and allow them to sin against him with impunity. The holiness of God's character is being used for his own evil ends. What has happened is King Balak, who has heard and, and has seen these two to three million Jews who have come out of Egypt and now they are there in the wilderness at the corner of his borders and he thinks with these many people 600,000 that are old enough to fight and hold a sword from the age of about 20, 25 on up to the age of 50 and that they're out there in the wilderness and pretty soon that they're going to come and so he hires King, uh, uh, the prophet Balaam to, to ask God to bring a curse on these people. And so he said, if you can't curse them, he said, let's corrupt them. There was the wisdom of the world. And then there was the worship of, of the world. And that was that Balaam, this Gentile prophet to King Balak, says, let's involve them in, in idolatry. And then judgment will be swift and judgment will, will be sure. The first two commandments that God gives have to do with idolatry. And God will not allow his people to have anything that, that, that he has consistently spoken of and called it an abomination. When God says, don't make any gods before me, don't have any other gods before me, don't worship any other gods, but I am a jealous God, that, that, that if you, you make an image or you love something more than you love God, th then you have become an idolater. And in this instance, it's not the worship or adoration of a graven image, but rather it is the entanglement and the participation of, of an evil practice that leads to worship and it becomes an idol to you. He not only talked about the worship of the world and the wisdom of the world, but he talked about the wickedness of the world. Sexual immorality. When you read the New Testament, you'll come across those grocery lists of, of, of the lust of the flesh. And it always has sexual sins at the very top of the list. It talks about fornication and adultery and loose living and, and all of these, these things. And, and the reason why sexual sins are placed at the top, because they're the most prominent in the cultures around the world. There is a sexual problem that we're having even in our world today, people who want to identify 
as something other than who they are. And, 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 and they want to change sexes. We, we have homosexuality. The LGBTQ XYZ or whatever else that they come up with has now identified themselves as, as one of, of 120 different identities. Listen, you get a choice of two identities in the Bible. You're male or you're female. And if you live and, and die and a hundred years later, it doesn't make any difference how they identified you or how you identified yourself. You're going to fit into one of those two categories. You're either going to be a male or you're going to be a female. The Bible speaks about several things concerning the prophet Balaam. One is the doctrine of, of Balaam. And the other is the way of Balaam. And the doctrine of, uh, 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 of Balaam was that, that let's intermingle and employ sexual immorality as a part of a religious practice. To imagine that, that, that a church would say, we're, we're going to have some, prophet, uh, some prostitutes to come into our church and they're going to be available to you men. Uh, it, it's going to cost you uh, $100 for each one of the women that are going to come. And, and the money is going to be used uh, to help us fund the new Bible study that's going on. Now, see, that makes no sense to us. But it made a lot of sense and still makes a lot of sense in, in some cultures today. Let's employ sexual activity with a means by which they could worship. Temple prostitutes were common. When, when we read the, the, the statement in, in the New Testament concerning deacons, let him be the husband of one wife. We've argued that ever since it's been written in the New Testament. What did he talk about? Well, how many wives could you have? Well, you could have your wife, wife, and then you could have the, the, the playgirl bunny uh, as, as a concubine, or you could have a temple prostitute where, where you would, would, would go and, and have a sexual relationship with, with her in the name of God. And, and you, you find that the New Testament era what was confronted with, with these kinds of people that were being saved. And so we find out that, that sexuality was an immorality, what was a part of a religious practice. And, and, and so we find out that this was the, the, the doctrine of, of Balaam. Let's get them to intermarry with all of those Moabites and the Hittites and the Hivites and Perizzites and the Jebusites and all of the Canaanites. And, and uh, let's do it in the name of God. And, and, and you can marry all, all, all of the, these folks when God said, no, this is not what you're to do. You're to take a wife from, from your own people. The way of Balaam. It's the covetousness of one who hires himself to do religious work for his personal gain. As, as Balaam did, the way is contrasted with, with the right way that, that is taking place. And the right way that, that is taking place uh, finds that, that Balaam's error was that he hired himself out as, as, as a prophet and epitomizes deceit and covetousness and you think if Balaam was such a prophet and he knows so much about God, he ought to have known that, that God's not going to put up with his foolishness. And God had warned Balaam, and, and we, we know the story of Balaam's donkey that, that had to talk and to instruct Balaam because... He told Balaam, he said, if you're going to continue to go the way that you're going, there is an angel with a flaming sword that's out here. That's basically what the donkey told him. And the donkey said, hey, I'm trying to save your life, which he never did. God ultimately killed Balaam for, for, for the sin that, that he did. 
There is the, the, the doctrine of, the, of Balaam and there is the way of Balaam. But also, uh, there's the doctrines of the Nicolaitans. The name means to conquer the people. Where there is a priestly order and then there is the clergy. Christ is no longer the final authority or a spokesman to the church. There is one who has the vicar of Christ. He stands in the place of Jesus and his word is law. He is, he is the Pope and he's over there in Rome. And when he speaks ex cathedra, out of, out of the throne, it carries the same weight as does anything that is in this Bible. He makes laws. He makes decrees. And the other day he made a decree that says we can bless same-sex marriages now. Even his own people says, you've gone crazy, man. You're a nut. You're, you're not a, a Bible leader. But you understand that he is the vicar of Christ. You notice that there are 12 to 15 more books in, in the, the Catholic Bible that's in our Bible. Why? Because in the 1600s, there was a pope that says they are to be in the Bible. So they put them in the Bible. What he says is, is law. And this is the doctrine of the Laetine, Nicolaitans. It's that, that the doctrine of Balaam denies the headship of Christ. And the doctrine of the Nicolaitans gives this headship to a man. And these are the two basic things that were happening there in the church itself. And then you will notice that not only do you look at the fact that there is a, a, a condemnation of what is going on, there, there is the counsel of, of Christ. Jesus was going to tell the church, here is how you mend the fence. Here is how you fix the problem. It's the good news or the gospel of how Things are made right in the church. To be reconciled is the theological term. To fall is not ruinous, he is saying to the church. For you to lay there is, knowing what's going on, there is hope for you. Errors can be corrected, but actions must be employed in order for you to fix the problem. Because problems don't fix themselves. What he is saying to the church, he says, repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. The solution to the problem, God is telling the church at Pergamos and he's telling the church at Enon, he said, listen, if there is a problem, let's fix it. And the way that we fix it is we fix it through repentance we change our mind and we change our direction we have a corresponding action to show that our mind has been changed and we turn from something that which is bad till we turn to something that which is good and that which is God is the plan and the perfect will of the Lord Jesus churches have problems it has problems because there are people in there. And when people have these problems, God said, hey, in order to be reconciled, you have to change your mind about what you're doing and what you're saying and where you're going and how you're acting. And it is something for the church to understand that, that, that we are a big family. And when big families gather together, Sometimes that they have problems that they need to work out and to get straightened out. That is what genuine repentance is all about. And to the church, he said, church, you need to repent of these two doctrines that you have. And then God speaks about his commendation. He says to the overcomer, everyone loves a winner. I and one of those people that I was eat up with being a winner, where I was playing cards or basketball or whatever it is, we went golfing 
uh, several years ago with what I call the over the hill gang. There's a bunch of golfers get together. Uh, Jim uh, McClenney is, is, is part of that group and, and still goes golfing with them. They're the over the hill bunch as I called them. And, and during one of our, our sessions when we, we were sitting around, the, one of them said, I come for the fellowship. And an, another one said, I come for, for, the, for the exercise. And both of them said, the, the score doesn't matter all of that much. And they say, why do you come, Brother John? I said, I come to beat you. <laughs> I don't care why you came. I want to shoot a lower score than you. It, it helps my ego. We love winners and we love people who win. And in this situation, even though that there is the doctrine of Balaam and, and there is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans that God said, I hate, he said, you can be an overcomer. You can be victorious over the flesh and the world and, and the devil and, 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 and you don't have to live a defeated life. The winner of a contest in those Olympic games that they would hold still holding them today. There's rewards and they were prizes that, that were given to the winners. Gold medals and silver medals and, and, and brass medals that, that, that were given. In biblical days, it was just a, a crown of woven vines that were, were put together. But we have something better. To, to, the, to the church, he, he says, listen, I have something better for you. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat and I will give him a white stone and on the stone a new name written which no one knows except he who receives it. There is God's provision for those persons who refuse to eat. Food that was offered to an idol was contrasted to the hidden manna that God had for them. Hidden manna comes and first appeared with the family of redeemed who had come out of Egypt and they were Mount Sinai there too to three million people that came out of Egypt. And now, what are we going to eat? When we were down there in Egypt, we had leeks and onions and garlics and, 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 and all of those good things. And now we've, we've come out here and we've followed you to Mount Sinai and we don't have any food. God said, I can fix that problem. And then they would get up in the morning and where dew normally was on the ground, there was manna. Manna is the Hebrew word for what is it? They stepped outside of their tent and they saw that stuff on the ground and they said manna, which means what is it? And God said to Moses, Moses, you tell those people that this is what they're going to eat. They're going to eat that in the morning and they're going to have flesh to eat, meat to eat in the evening because the quails are going to come and, and you can beat them with sticks and, and, and you can have God's provisions. And God had a provision for the church, for those, those people that, that would not eat things sacrificed un, un, unto idols. God says, I got something better. I got some hidden manna just for you. Hidden manna can be taken in a spiritual thing when God says, the way that you're living, I've got a better life that, that you can live. When Jesus told his disciples, I must needs go through Samaria. And his disciples probably thought, Lord, Lord you, don't, you don't know our custom. We, we don't start here, go through Samaria and, and to get up there in Galilee. We go this way. 1,500 miles down, uh, 100 feet downhill, down to Jericho, we cross the Jordan River, and then we go up the east side of the Jordan River into Decapolis, those places of the 10 cities there in, in, in Galilee, because we don't want to go through Samaria. Jews don't have any dealings with the Samaritans. But Jesus said, I've got to go through Samaria. And we know the story about meeting the woman at the well. 
It's lunchtime. One of the disciples heard his stomach growling and said, Lord, we need something to eat and we want to go into the town. And all of the disciples left and went into town and left Jesus there with this Samaritan woman. And he ultimately went her to the Lord. You know, you know the story, how this woman came and she was going to draw her water pot. And Jesus said, hey, if you knew about the water I could give you, well, you would ask of him and he'd give you everlasting water. And the story went on till he ultimately said to her when she said, well, when Messiah gets here, he'll tell us all things. And Jesus said, I that speak to thee am he. And she ran out into Samaria and began to talk to all of the people, bringing them so that they could meet the Lord Jesus. After all this confrontation with all of the people and, and, and Jesus leading so many of them to himself, they, they went on their way and the disciples came bringing some food. And the disciples said, let's eat. And Jesus says, I have food to eat that you don't know anything about. And the disciples scratched their heads and said, who gave him something to eat while we were gone? And Jesus said, listen, what, what, what I have done outweighs eating that is my meat to do the will of him who sent me it's something that is spiritual that 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 when we do something for jesus it has more importance than filling up our spiritual uh, our physical bodies because it's spiritual there was god's provisions of him who refused to eat and then there was God's pledge to him who refused loose living. God said, I've got a pure stone. And this stone was significant to the Greeks, to the Hebrews, to the Romans, and now to Christians. And it would take another whole session of this meeting to tell us how the Greeks thought of this stone, how the Hebrews thought of a stone and how the Romans thought of a white stone and now how Christians are thinking about it. But we find out that when we read all the commentaries that we would recite during this session that we're talking about stones, the commentators can't even agree what this stone means. So let me tell you a couple of things. The significance of the color. It's white. And white is a symbol of purity. And the color white is used 17 times in the book of the Revelation. There's white hair and white clouds and white robes and white garments and white thrones and white horses. And now there's a white stone. It's a pure stone. White in color. There is a surname that's on the stone. I'm going to write on that a name that no one knows. And no one can figure it out in the books that I've read what that name is. It's just a name that, that is given. The question is, what do you do with this white stone? And what does it do for you? And one author summed it up this way. A white stone was regarded as a token of favor, prosperity, or excess everywhere whether it's considered as a vote or given to a victor. It would denote that the Christians to whom it is said to be given would meet the favor of Jesus himself, the Redeemer of the world. And we would have a token of his approval. If Rick got one, or some of you others got one, then it would just be that you have met the favor of and you are getting a present. God likes what you're doing. It's a token of his approval. The name that's written on the stone would designate also a token or a pledge of his favor. If I gave Rick a white stone and then I pinned my name on it and said, here, Rick, it's a present. It's an everlasting thing for you. You keep this. And that you always be reminded of the person who gave it to you. Kind of like Christmas presents. It's not just the gift, it's the giver that we recognize at Christmas. My wife got me a present, or my friend, husband got me a present. 
It's emblematic of, of, of favor and approval. And, and so it would be marked as, as indicating that name of the giver as comes with Jesus and has a new name on it that no one understands. When we think about that, think about a locket that women wear. I don't wear them. They do. And you open it up, and there is a picture that reminds them of the person who gave it or something valuable, just showing favor to those people. Maybe you can think of it as a cameo. Cameo is a little thing that people wear that has an outline, maybe of their husband or their wife or their children, that, that is on that. This is what the white stone really is. It is something that is given as a token of favor by the Lord Jesus Christ himself, whereby he says in the day that believers will enter into the new kingdom after they have stood before the judgment seat of Christ, they're going to receive the stone which God is saying, you did good while you were there. He's saying to Pergamos the same thing. He said, if you'll be an overcomer, if you'll be victorious over the sins of the doctrine of Balaam, over the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, I have something special for you. I got some spiritual food that the other world doesn't know anything about. But I also have something physical. I've got a white stone that I'm going to give you to let you know that I love you and that I care for you. Back during the Depression, 25% of the people were out of work. Businesses were closing. People were standing in bread lines and doing all sorts of things. Out of that... Some businesses was started. One of those businesses that started during the Depression of the 20s and 30s was Hallmark Cards. They just started giving little, little friendship cards that you would mail. And now we've gone overboard with it. We send thank you cards. We, send, we have Christmas cards. We have Easter cards. We have Valentine cards. We, we have birthday cards. We have sorry to hear that you're sick cards, sorry to hear that you've lost a loved one card. Everything started with those Hallmark cards. They adopted a slogan when they started their business during the times of the Depression. And that slogan is, when you care enough to send the very best. That's on the back of all the Hallmark cards. When you care enough to send the very best, you'll send them a Hallmark card. Jesus was the same thing. It was God's way of saying, when you care enough, I'm going to give you the very best. He does that in giving us Jesus and his salvation, but also for our service. When you've cared enough to give the very best, God said, I've got some manna for you that nobody knows anything about. And I'm also going to give you a white stone during the time of the judgment of Christ and the second coming that has a new name written on it as a gift to the fact that I'm showing you favor or the work you did. It's like saying, well done, good and faithful servant. I've got something for you. And he gives you that white stone. And you keep that as an amulet, as, as, as a thing that says, hey, that God cared enough that he gave me the very best, and that I cared enough that I would not submit to the doctrine of Balaam, and I did not submit to the way of Balaam, and I did not submit to the doctrines of the Nicolaitans, which wanted to, to separate the clergy from, from the laity and have sexual immorality and practices that was connected with life and living in the church. And God says, hey, you've done good. You're an overcomer. You're victorious. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty through God 
of the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every vain thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Father, thank you. You've blessed us today. You blessed us with a wonderful place. You blessed us with the day the Lord has made and we're rejoicing in it. You blessed us with, with Christian living and told us that we can be victorious in our walk with you. We can be winners with Jesus Christ. Victorious in his name. And we thank you for that as we pray in Jesus' name.